think it should be good. What's up, everybody? Welcome to another week of the life. So we're going into how to train multi-sport athletes at the same time. And I think some of that comes back to one is getting the athlete to actually identify what is their favorite sport or what are they actually going to be training for i think that's the one of the hardest aspects of of a multi-sport athlete is sometimes they're really good at two of those specific sports so then they're going well i don't know if i want to train for football let's say if we have a dude or i want to train for track um, but then the next thing is like what if they're training for two sports that are also very very different okay so think about um, you know, there was actually a shot putter who won a state title in Pennsylvania, who was a very good swimmer and golfer at the same time as being a state champion shot putter. And he went on to be a D one all American. His name was actually Justin Clickett. He, uh, was a savage swimmer and a savage golfer and totally different movements. I mean, the golfing is actually ironically, uh, now coming to light that golfing is pretty similar to throwing but swimming uh is very different so i think when we're when we're looking at training those multi-sport athletes i think it's got to come down to what type of qualities can we see uh as a as a carryover and then obviously um is there some type of training carryover or is there some uh, way that we could get these athletes to be really good at two sports? I'm thinking about Deion Sanders, Bo Jackson, and even looking at Bo Jackson. Uh, dude was an absolute animal in the decathlon and in baseball while also being really good at football, clearly. And if you think about Deion Sanders, he was a great track runner, you know, absolute beast uh, on the track while also being in the major leagues for baseball and then also being um, a total dog on the field for football. So I think that the big step is just identifying like, okay, is there any carryover? Are there any exercises that we can look at based off of uh, the sport, right? So if you're a baseball player and you're explosive and you're really fast, those are great strength qualities, Okay. Now the hand-eye coordination is going to be the skill. Okay. Um, the ability to throw is going to be the skill. So that's going to have to be worked on in the specific timeline uh, out on the field. Now, if you're a base or if you're a football player, if you're explosive, if you're strong, that's great. Now, if you can catch the ball or if you can track the ball or you can read defenses, read offenses, that's part of the skill. So we've got to differentiate as a strength coach uh, and identify. What part of it is truly the skill at the at the sporting level versus skills that we're going to teach them in the weight room that will carry over? And that's where also, like, if we're developing strength, if we're developing their ability to squat more or do general movements really well, and then learning how to, let's say, sprint or or run faster or cut quicker, those are the, the lifts that – or those are the movement patterns and lifts that will end up having a very, very good transfer or – uh, I've, I've been reading quite a bit here, um, dynamic correspondence. So um, I think this is this next question. This is something that we get asked a lot. They're like, Dane, okay, that's great. If I, if I hear that, what are some very simple strength standards that you can, you can give a high school kid that they could in, t in turn take with them and apply, you know, into their, into their life, right? Like, so high school kids specifically. Let's only keep it to high school males, actually, and look at it and say, what are some simple strength numbers that we should be working towards, okay, that will have a positive carryover? And the thing that I just want to air this out that pisses me off is when strength coaches can't answer this question and they're like, well, it's all dependent upon the organism and it's also dependent upon, you know, what are their uh, anthropometric makeup and and what's their their strategy that they're going to be using? What's the menu items that we're selecting and how long is their training age? And it's like, dude, we're coaches in a situation where we're trying to take kids in eighth or ninth grade and get them to the NCAA and become, you know, the best that they can absolutely become. So on the male level, right? If we have an individual who let's play, they, they, they golf and they're a track runner. Like if they could clean 1.25 body weight, they're going to be good. Okay. If they could clean one and a half times body weight, they're going to be really explosive, really explosive. So those are some simple responses. Okay. If we're going to back squat, if they could back squat 1.5 to 1.75 times body weight, 
dude, they're they're doing really good job. They're on the path. They're on the way to becoming better athletes. If they can bench press 1.25 body weight to 1.5 times body weight, they're going to be strong. If they can bust out 10 plus pull-ups, they're going to be freaking strong. Okay. They're going to be on that, that pathway to being, you know, they're going to be starting for their, their high school team and then likely working past that if they're achieving these numbers. And I think that that's where it's like, even if I'm somebody who is a golfer, okay, if I golf and I would go do single leg squats, I should be able to hit my body weight for a set of five on each leg. And that should, that should be reasonable, a reasonable goal to get to within a year. Okay. So for strength coaches to sit there and just consistently say, well, I don't want to provide these simple benchmarks, you know, get out of here, provide these high school kids with some simple benchmarks so that they can play multiple different sports and be good at them. Okay. Now, if we're looking at the female uh, population, I think it's 405 bench in high school is the only metric. Absolutely. Russell, if we're looking at the female population, it's like, all right, if we can get a woman in high school, okay. To clean body weight, she's doing great. You know, you get a a 60 K clean or 60, 65 K clean. They're doing really well. If you can push that to like 1.1 to 1.2 times body weight, that's fantastic. That's great. I actually think body weight, single leg squats. Again, if they weigh 70 kilos, they should be able to hit a set of five. Okay. If they're weigh, if they weigh 60 kilos, they should be able to hit a set of five. This is one thing that absolutely is mind blowing is that you'll hear, um, I'm sort of going off on a little bit of an attack here on the, on the world of strength and conditioning, but we'll get these, these elite level coaches and they're talking about measuring athletes on, on their hamstring strength on a vault. And then looking at like their power output bilaterally. If we're, uh, if we're talking about like force plate production and then it's like, well, let's see what type of isometric strength or isometric tension they can, they can create in a split position. Dude, they can't even back squat like body weight for a set of five. Just get them to do that. Back squat, you know, 1.3 times body weight before you even are worried about their force output into a freaking into a force plate. Like get a get a high school girl to hit five to ten dead hang pull ups. Like seriously, there's no reason why that shouldn't happen before we start measuring, you know, their hamstring strength or what kind of force production they're putting into, into plates. Like those are very easy, easy benchmarks that that a high school girl could achieve. You know, you're looking at like, okay, 1.1, 1.2 times body weight on a power clean. Like that's, that's reasonable, very reasonable body weight, single leg squat for five back squat, 1.3 to 1.5 for reps. Like that, that's, that stuff's that that that's very reasonable. I wanted to throw that out there. Those are some simple standards that, just regardless of sport, we can work towards. Okay, and I think that 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 is simple. Okay, how do you train for one sport while another one is in season? Is a great one. So this could go into, let's say we've got a basketball player, and and this is this is pretty commonplace. You've got a basketball player who's also a high jumper, uh, or or maybe a long jumper, right? Um, or you've got a I'm thinking about Sarah Marvin, who was an all state. She was a girl that we coached that was an all state basketball player two years in a row and then won the U.S. high school national championship in the shot. How do we do that? Okay, so when she's in season for basketball, we are only lifting twice a week. One day would be really easy, explosive stuff, meaning like the load would be lighter. Just focusing on, you know, plyometric based movements body body weight movements uh focusing on drills as far as being a shot putter and then one day a week we would do almost like a full body workout okay now if um if something happened where she didn't have to compete for like a week on the basketball court well then we would start to lift a little bit heavier for that week so that she could get a little bit of strength gains and then the following week if she had two to three days of of you know court competitive situations well then we had to back off with those heavier lifts so in that case with sarah you know focusing on basketball and focusing on throwing they're they're a little dissimilar they're they're a little different because of the energy requirements the bio the bioenergetic necessities that go into basketball are slightly different from from uh from throwing and so i think that that just comes into that rolling comp comprehension um 
and understanding what's going into the actual sport, understanding the the sport tasks at hand, recognizing basketball is is a tremendous skill. The sport is is very skill based. So is throwing. She's got to have time to do some type of drill work for that throwing preparation, and she's got to be able to to focus on a couple different things and balance her time management as well as possible. And I think that's one other aspect is that a lot of this stuff's going to come back to the health. And the mentality of the athlete, you know, if they're doing multiple different sports, can they manage their stress? Can they deal with things on a week to week basis uh, to handle that stress? Uh, because that's going to put them in a better situation. That's going to put them in a, in a better that's going to set them up for uh, more ability to handle the stress of the two different sports or three different sports potentially. OK, so I think that that's that's some some things that just also need to be said. Now, how often should an athlete train if they are in season throughout the year? So let's say that they, you know, let's say using Sarah's case, she played basketball and she also was a thrower. Let's add in that if she was playing field hockey, right? Or, you know, if we have another basketball player in there, it's a dude and that dude's also playing, you know, football and then basketball and then track. The big factor there is I do believe you have to prioritize one of those three and then if you could prioritize one of those three, your lifting would be based off of um, that main sport. So in the case of a football player who plays basketball, who's also a shot putter, if they want to be the best shot putter, that's going to be the priority training that they're going to be doing. So even in season for football, they're going to be doing mainly shot put based training. Even, you know, let's pretend they're a center. Even during basketball season, they're going to be doing mainly uh, throwing base training during basketball season. And then obviously during actual track season, they're going to be doing uh, throwing base training. And so if we're going to do three sports, I believe you should be selecting what sport you're best at and then build upon that. And I think that that's like, that's a pretty key concept as well is that you do have to figure that out. You also have to figure out during the actual seasons of football or basketball, you know, if you're going to focus on track or, or vice versa, there's got to be points of development of volume that you're going to work towards. I think sometimes we sort of forget uh, that there's got to be some type of volume or some type of preparation that goes into these things. And so I, I just wanted to share some of some of those different aspects. I do want to go into a couple different um Uh, video reactions to uh, if kids need to play multiple different sports or not, if they should specialize or not. We're going to break down. There's a really cool paper uh, that I'm going to go into, which is going to show the prevalence of high school multi-sport athletes in the NFL. So how many guys in the NFL played multiple different sports? And we're going to go into that study. But before we get into that study, I want to check out a uh, a couple different videos here. Okay, and we're going to look at Les Spellman, who's trained a lot of guys in the NFL. And, um, like growing up, I played everything. And sports are a training stimulus as well. So basketball players are forced to jump, cut, stop, decelerate, accelerate, uh, which, which helps in every sport. Soccer, you're, you're forced to have awareness on your feet. So you, you definitely have, like, you build different skills within the sport. So, for example, like, I, I saw this thing on Twitter where it was like, if I want to improve a pull-up, does rock climbing and pull that, uh, improve that? Yeah, it does because it's it's dynamic. It's in the field. It's not so much a weight room, but uh, you're building strength and you're building qualities. So uh, some, of these, some of these sports are helping build different uh, qualities you wouldn't get just training. So, like, aerobic qualities, speed endurance qualities, deceleration, volume ability. Um, so kids need to play sports, more sports, and uh, you know even run run track. You know there's a lot of negative talk about people running track. Like, oh well, track coaches aren't good. Track coaches aren't that. I'm like, yo, <laughs> if you run full speed on a hard surface like a track that's bouncy, you're gonna you're gonna get faster. I don't care if your track coach is my mom. Like, you running on a hard surface as fast as you can, racing against other people will make you faster initially. And obviously after that you need to hone in. But that's why. You- yeah, I think I think he's got some really good points there where it's like, look, we've got to keep focusing on um especially I'm thinking about my own son. My son's 12 years old right now and it and it's like, okay, so he's skiing when when we can go skiing. He he does play ice hockey. Uh he's swimming quite a bit. He's throwing with us. He's lifting weights. Uh he played football. He's played soccer for a couple different years for so I think when you're looking at it, it's like especially at a younger age, all of those different sports provide qualities and provide 
uh, means of coordination that, that the athlete has to learn. And also the kid has to learn how to be a little bit more coachable if they want to be good. So that's like another big factor. Okay. So this is going to be from smart around, like you talked about, like, what is that best sport? What's that number one sport? What's that sport you want to get recruited for? If you're a, a female playing volleyball in the fall, you're playing basketball in the winter and running track in the spring. Um, and you want to be a basketball player, but you're also playing club volleyball, that doesn't make a whole lot of sense. So I think it's important that if you're going to play three sports at the high school level, if you are going to play a club or travel, that that's the sport that you want to get recruited for, your best sport, maybe your favorite sport. So um, again, it's not necessarily a bad thing that you're a three-sport athlete. Again, coaches kind of have their different opinion. Um, but depending on the sport, if you're playing a high school sport instead of playing a travel sport that maybe overlaps in the same season, that could be a negative against you because you're missing out on maybe getting um, some more exposure, some opportunity to play against better kids. Yeah, I think this dude's making some fair points. I think there is a there is a um, I think there is one of those instances where I see what he's saying as far as some of that stuff is concerned. I I, I think it's like I think we could all just make sure as kids are developing, it's like there's going to be a point of selecting like one over the others. And, and I think that there's, there's a, a point too, where it's like, look, like probably around the age of 16 is when you're going to make that decision. Like, all right, I'm going to go all in on this. If I play another sport, it's more of like just a, re a recovery aspect from, from that main sport. All right. So this is Chris Barnard from overtime. I want to hear power training TV, all things power related. Um Actually. So this is a, Oh, this is from 10 years ago. Holy crap, I had never seen this. And this is actually, if I remember correctly, I think Barnard used to, if I remember, this was Elliot Hulse's old gym. Read another question from a guy. He was basically telling me he's about to start school come April. So you got one, actually, holy shit. I don't know when you're going to get this done. But uh, sorry for <laughs> answering this late, buddy. But uh, <laughs> he wanted to know. Yo, this is great. Also, I just want to point out, I've always thought uh, Barnard from Overtime Athletes is really good on camera. So it's really cool to see a video that's 10 years old and to see how well he's progressed. And I think that this is just, this is actually an example of why it makes sense to eventually get to that point of specialization. Because uh, you can see how Chris here, you know, is a, a much more off the cuff, which is cool. Yeah, like it's it's cool to watch this. Uh but now seeing where he's at currently, God, it's crazy. Coming up and he has such a wide variety of sports. And he plays uh, frisbee and uh, I don't know what. He named like six different sports or whatever, something like that. And he has a strongman competition coming up for school. For school. And he does like farmer walks and vertical jump tests and battle ropes and Prowler pushes, and I forget what else he said, but, yo, what school do you go to? I want my <laughs> unborn children to go there if they're doing that kind of shit. This also just reminds me of myself when we when we first started. Holy <laughs> crap. That's dope as hell. But um, he wants to know what he should do in such a small time frame, I guess, to prepare for these types of things. Let me just give you a quick rundown and try to make this as short as possible. Pick an athletic training program that you can find anywhere on the web. You check out Green Iron Domination. Pick one that will get you more athletic, more explosive, and then go ahead and use those things that you need to test out for as your accessory or before that actual program. So okay, so that's where that's still very great answer there uh, from Chris is like if you could if you can look at this and say all right. I'm going to I'm going to focus on one main sport, okay, here and then off of that one main sport, I'm selecting let's say two to three main lifts that transfer really well. And this is where I would say like having transfer training comprehension and saying, "All right, if I could do a big clean, a back squat or a clean and a single leg squat and some benching or and I dude, we have a, you know, thinking about this old school YouTube video, um that old school YouTube video, it's like 
we've got a video where it's like, okay, if I would just snatch and bench, that would be like the perfect program. I would do that for three years. And you just snatch and bench and you're going to become a freak athlete. Like you're going to have a strong upper body and you're going to be explosive. Okay. Literally that, that does have some basis or some bearing when we're talking about actual development of, of multi-sport athletes. It's like, what sports can we, or what lifts can we use like a snatch, like a front squat, like a single leg squat, like a back squat that will carry over, you know, if I can bench and pull-ups, like that's probably all I need to do for my upper body work. And then Chris was just mentioning, okay, you know, Barnard's going, all right, if you do that and then you use the test for like strongman or you do something as an accessory specific to one of the sports that you're playing, that makes it a lot easier to manage that entire, you know, different load of, of what you're looking at when we're talking about multi-sport athletes. If you guys want to go vote on the community poll, poll here uh, we got a poll going on about how many sports is too many is it two sports is it three sports is it four sports and i think there there could be in theory um some age related to this um and i also think that that it's interesting called or it's interesting when you think about too like weightlifting could in theory be a sport and you could also be using it for uh you know for other sports as well um andrew's just coming i want to po point this out Old YouTube's crazy. There's this hilarious old channel called Garage Times that has some wild stuff. Well, no, Andrew, the videos were called Garage Times. If you go back on the Garage Strength channel, like 2009, 2010, you'll see videos that we posted called Garage Times. Um, I actually have a secret channel from when YouTube first started that has some of my old training footage from college. I'm going to... I'll be interested to see if you guys can find that. If you guys can find that, I will. We should do video breakdowns next week on our public live because there's some old school throwbacks uh, of me training in college at Penn State that are absolutely wild. Um, yeah, I just wanted to throw that one, throw that out there. Uh, I want to go into now. I wanted to. I wanted to look at some of these research papers uh, and see see what you guys think. Um, also we are going to be releasing a new update for our strength training at peak strength here in the next, I think in the next two weeks, I think it's February 6th is when that, that is going to be updated. It might be a little bit later. We're testing some of the speed stuff. We're, we're putting a new motor into the app essentially is what we're doing. Uh, there's going to be enhanced processing speed, more options to track your feeling after sets and even a share workout feature that's going to work a little bit more seamlessly. So you guys can share those workouts on your Instagram, you know, Facebook, wherever you are. Um, ask them a trivia question and I will reveal it. Jason, you gotta, you gotta, you gotta, what do you, what do you mean? Ask them a, a trivia question. Give it to members of the channel to make up for, Oh, Oh, Andrew. Nice. Um, I'm trying to think of a good trivia question. Uh, he was the brother of Ted Koppel. Is that what you're asking me to do? Jason? Is that what you're asking? The brother of Ted Koppel. That would be my response. Let me see if that, that helps. So if you guys are on Instagram, you can't see this on Instagram, but if you are on Instagram and you go over to the YouTube channel right here, go to the YouTube channel, you could see some of the stuff that we're going to be going over. We're going over the prevalence of high school multi-sport participation in elite NFL athletes. So big, big factor here, okay? What are the objectives? Early youth specializations, pretty prevalent. Um, people are doing more research with it as well. And it can be identified as a risk factor for overuse injuries. And I, th I think that's especially going to be prevalent in sports like baseball, uh, swimming, um, injury wise. I think those are the, like two that pop into my head, uh, because it's such a repetitive movement pattern over and over and over and over again. I think, uh, sports like wrestling and soccer are going to experience more burnout um, not, t not Nick cage, Andrew, I think wrestling and soccer experience more burnout, whereas the other sports experience more direct overuse injuries. Um, and so let me, I just wanted to, to, to throw that out there. So this, this paper that is right here. Okay. Um, they were looking to study and characterize high school sports specialization and guys that are in the NFL. And they wanted to see if there's an association between single sport specialization and future injury risk, performance, and longevity. So NFL first-round draft picks from 08 to 17, 
Uh, they looked at a, a data on the number of games played, overuse injuries, causing athletes to miss one or more regular season games, Pro Bowl selections, and current status. So 318 athletes were looked at. Multi-sport athletes were highly prevalent. 88% of the people. So they pulled from 318 guys in the NFL. 318. 88% of them played more than one sport, uh, multi-sport athletes. 88%. Only 12% of athletes were classified as single sport. There was no difference between multi-sport and single sport athletes regarding games missed or lower extremity injuries, total games played. There was no significant difference in the proportions of athletes reaching at least one Pro Bowl. The majority of NFL first-round draft picks were multi-sport athletes in high school. Single-sport football participation in high school does not appear to aid athletes in reaching or succeeding in the NFL. I think this is an interesting paper because they're essentially looking at, I feel like they were originally trying to make this paper about like, all right, well, let's prove out that if you play more than if you don't play more than one sport, you're going to get hurt more. They couldn't prove that out, so then they pivoted and they basically concluded that if you want to be somebody in the NFL, it's probably better to actually play more than one sport. I think it's probably in DJ uh, who works here at Garage Strength. He and I sort of talk about this quite a bit where it's like, all right, I actually think you probably should play two sports. I think by the time you're a sophomore going into your junior year, you have a really good idea of like, all right, for me to get to the next level, this is the sport I want to play. I want to just focus on this sport and this sport. And, and that's probably the best way to roll with it. Uh, honestly, that's sort of how I feel. Um, and I think typically that's, that's probably going to be what you end up seeing. Um, now the next one is going to be a much more in-depth one. I think what, if we can just stick to the abstract, I think it's probably going to be better. You know, so this is going to be youth sports, and this is who is the brother? Oh, geez, who is the brother of Ted Koppel? Is that how you spell Koppel? I couldn't even remember. I, I didn't know if there's two P's or not. Um, that's a that's a hint too. So, um, Andrew, the hint that Jason, if you can figure out, and I don't know if Ted Koppel has an actual brother, but I can tell you. There's a comedy show where Ted Koppel has a brother and his brother's name is my old handle on YouTube, but it's a specific play on his handle. That's another hint I'm going to give you. So if we look at this paper, if you're not on uh, YouTube right here, youth sports specialization and its effect on professional elite and Olympic athletes, career longevity, you know, basically a full systematic review. And so if we're looking at this, um, Let's look at, let's just get down to here. So 8,756 articles, okay, 29 full studies were included, of which 17 were survey-based of the 18 articles that commented on uh, injury risk. So performance benefits were apparent with later specialization in seven and nine, nine articles. So what they ended up doing is they would go, okay, we're going to do a systematic review from 1990 to 2021 on youth sports specialization in professional, elite, and or Olympic athletes. Okay? 1990 to 2021. Ted Koppel was a uh, – you forgot who's Ted Koppel. Ted Koppel was a uh, broadcaster. He used to be on – I think it was 2020. Was it 2020 or Dateline? Just you Google him, Andrew. Come on. <laughs> Uh, track and field athletics definitely need weightlifting. Their lifting techniques are the worst. Uh, okay, so let's go back to this. Okay, so 1990 to 2021 on youth sports specialization, professional, elite, and or Olympic athletes. Um, an elite athlete was defined as one who performed at the highest level of his or her, her sport beyond college. So if you're considered elite, if you went to the NFL, you're elite. If you, obviously, if you went to world championships, you're elite. If you, you know, anything along those lines, that's how they're defined. That's pretty freaking elite. Um, it's tough because in, in the U S dude, some of the sports that you have to play to be elite, it's crazy to be an American shopper to be considered elite. You got to beat two of the best shoppers of all time. Um, just want to throw that out there. So data was summarized according to six objectives, definitions of specialization, age, participation in other sports, motivation for specialization, athlete perspectives on specialization, performance data, and then uh, injury risk and career longevity. And so what they concluded, current data on sports specialization in elite 
and professional and Olympic athletes are mostly retrospective and survey-based evidence. Most sports demonstrate better performance after youth multi-sport engagement and youth sports specialization was linked with increased injury risk at the highest levels. Now, that's not very accurate in relation to what they found with the guys in the NFL. Again, I think my stance on this, What which one's this? Oh, this is Jason's. I think my stance on this entirely would be, and this came out in November of 2022. I think it's like start off, I think start off essentially with, if you're raising a kid or if you're a child right now, right? I believe weightlifting should not be considered a sport. That's just part of a supplement to your actual sporting development. Um, okay, so that's like the first step. I think the same thing with sprinting. I think sprinting doesn't need to be factored as a sport. I think you you should be playing three sports essentially till you're 14. Okay, then when you're 14, 15, 16, you can, you can start to dial in. Okay, should I sh- shift to two sports? Around the age of 17 to 18, you might be like, I'm going all in. I'm going all in on this one specific sport. You know, by the time you're in college, you're, you're just doing one sport. So I think it's great to play two sports. I think you should dial it down to two sports probably by like your senior year, obviously by freshman year. I think sometimes at smaller schools, it's fine to play three sports. I, um, yeah, I went to a small high school, so we played three sports all the way up until you graduated but i do think that that can hinder some of your training action training activity you know and if you want to be really really good that's the other thing is like how good do you want to be you know if if you want to be really really good like you might want to specialize by the time you're like 16 or 17 okay but that's later so you should be playing as many sports as possible before that um you know if you want to specialize a little earlier like 14 it's probably okay As long as you have like a breadth of like other sports, I also think it's important that you still play other sports recreationally. I think that's one aspect too, is like, let's say you're a shot putter and you specialize on throwing, you should still be playing basketball or Frisbee or, you know, doing other things that, that will help with your overall coordination. I think that stuff, um, hint for the poll, the videos on YouTube. I think that that, that's, you know, that's some of the stuff that, that you can factor in. So how many sports is Lincoln doing? My oldest son right now, um, I want to say five or six, five or six is what he's doing right now. If we factored in, you know, when he gets to go skiing and stuff like that, um, I think he's probably going to narrow that down to two or three in the next two years. Um, probably three, if you include weightlifting in there. So, yeah, I think this is like a, a it's a discussion that I don't think there's a very clear answer to because I also think there's the aspect of socialization. You know, a lot of people, you know, Nicholas grew up playing basketball and and a singleton grew up playing. By the way, check this out. That's pretty sick. But Nick grew up playing basketball and uh football and then by the time he was a freshman he stopped playing basketball, and then his sophomore year, he went out for track, and then he ran track all the way through, and you know ran like a ten seven one and a hundred, and was a forty foot ch- or a fifty foot shot putter. So it's like that's pretty cool, you know. I think, and that didn't hinder him. Um, okay, so if I get into this now, I'm going to go back. I'm going to check this out. Some of your guys' questions, uh, and let's get into what are you guys asking? Isaiah is saying he had a concussion on Tuesday, and he'll probably be out for the rest of his wrestling season. What can I do once I'm cleared? So so um, I'm going to go back to this. I'm going to go back here, okay? I'm going to help you out here, Isaiah, and look at, um, let's just say, let's go to, oh, I'm already on PubMed. Okay, so if I'm on PubMed here, uh, I'm going to type in creatine and concussions, okay? So you got to talk to your doctors about this, but uh, effects of creatine, um, supplementation here's one from scott forbes who i've had on a podcast and stephen cornish i've had him on a podcast as well darren kandow probably one of the biggest researchers in uh creatine so this one is going to talk about uh, effects of creatine on brain health and function it's 
essentially going to show you if you show this to your doctor creatine is going to help can nick dunk i bet you he can i don't know for sure but i would assume that so isaiah the other thing you could do um let's see here so brain metabolites some of the i'm trying to look for creatine supplementation and brain health let me see if i can get up uh richard Kreider. there's a paper specifically that actually shows um creatine a higher level of creatine can increase recovery from from a concussion um health and disease uh role of creatine supplementation and conditions with mitochondrial dysfunction anyway what before i get lost in there because that's what i'm going to end up doing i would recommend um increasing creatine i would talk to your doctor for uh creatine and brain health obviously these are all things that you have to get cleared from your doctor do not just listen to me but i'm just trying to you know there's some research that you can take to them uh, on the efficacy uh, on how it can help with brain health brain health and cognitive uh, function so david uh, n-acetylcysteine also yes you're accurate um yeah andrew i echo that as well um i think Obviously, too, I would say this, Isaiah, uh, anything that's going to improve your sleep should also help. That's where sauna before bed can help that deep uh, sleep as well, deep wave sleep. That's going to be a big one, too. R2, coming back in. I haven't seen you in here in a while, R2. How are you doing? Uh, I'm in the military right now. And I do not have much training. Uh, I don't have much training time per week, maybe one to three nights. What should I do to prioritize speed drills? Uh R2, I'd say, can you lift once a week? Can you run hills once a week and then do calisthenics for your upper body once a week? Something like that. Let me know if that that works. Um, I'm getting LASIK in two hours from Andrew. Any advice on the mandatory taper after the procedure? Um, I would say, Andrew, with LASIK, I feel like your recovery is pretty quick. What is it? Isn't that like five days? I think you'll be good. I think, the, I think you'll be good. Yeah, I, I don't have any... I don't have any recommendation other than it's a, yeah, I, I know it's a little weird. Like the surgery itself is weird from what I've heard, but I've also heard like it, it's sort of cool when you get out of it and it, and it's done pretty well for you. Uh, in the field, I do hurdles, standing long jump and standing triple jump. This is from Satu. Hamala'ayan, Laninen. Satu, are you Finnish? Just asking. Um, Let's see here. Five sports, but don't you think that is too much? I think five sports is probably too much at a point. Keist is asking, um, are there any sports that are better as a second sport than others? Say gymnastics as a secondary sport. I think gymnastics is a freaking awesome sport to really learn, but there's a point where they specialize very, very early. Wrestling is another one. Another great one for body awareness is wrestling. Uh, obviously, gymnastics fantastic for specialization i actually do believe baseball is pretty good because it's so hand-eye coordination based i think learning how to throw things uh is something the u.s is very good at that as far as like it's sort of weird when you see somebody who can't throw a football or a baseball or like like they just don't have like the throwing mechanics that a like an american kid grows up just learning how to throw baseballs um and it's like sort of weird when you see Europeans not know how to throw a baseball or a or a football. I I do think there's there is a point to that um, as a secondary sport that throwing things like that hand eye coordination. I actually even think like badminton and 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 table tennis are great for hand eye coordination and brain activity. That neural activity can can help with coordination, uh, and you can see that in badminton players and in table tennis players. Like these athletes are unbelievably fast and unbelievably coordinated uh so i think it does play big dividend big dividends in that that regards um randy kpl there you go i've done hapkido to green belt almost blue belt that was a good sport oh that's funny andrew's saying stop calling me out. i know how to throw discs not actually yeah I, I think frisbees too like that's another good one a lot of people don't know how to throw a frisbee and they just crank on it and the the frisbee just collapses and it's like some of the stuff that that i think should be some skills that i think should be taught and learned is simple throwing um simple shooting mechanics for basketball um 
gymnastics awareness, wrestling awareness, tumbling, things like that. Uh, can you train reaction speed? 100%. There's even research that'll show that um, based off of, and this is, so this is sprint specific, but based off of the condition of the athlete, if their response is in a 60 versus the 100 versus the 200 versus the 400 versus the 800, athletes know that the start has greater prevalence in the 60 versus the 100 versus the 2 versus the 4 versus the 8. So reaction time is usually based off of how how much anticipation there is for the start based off of the relevance to the to the actual event. Where I'm going with this is that athletes can change their their reaction time when they when they go so let's say somebody's an 800 runner and they shift to the 400. It's shown in research that over time, their reaction time improves because of the anticipation. Reaction time can 100% be trained. It's a skill. Rate of force development is a type of skill, okay? And that leads to impulse expression. So if we think through that lens, absolutely, athletes can change their 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 reaction time. If athletes learn how to um, apply a massive amount of force in a very short period of time, they over time can develop that re reaction capability. And now circling back to the question of what are good secondary sports, if you go back to the table tennis discussion or badminton or um, tennis, pickleball, these sports, right? The rapid reaction helps you learn and be anticipatory and and understand the 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 kinematics of your opposition so if you're watching a pickleball player hit something towards you their their actual counter movement that they're doing is going to help you predict where the ball is going to go so you start to understand their kinematics and then you improve your reaction time based off your anticipation Okay, so that's like how we learn how to how to fire uh, more effectively, how to have our afferent signals and go to our body and be like, okay, we've got to do this, and then and then react. And so um, you'll see that happen. And and what's interesting with start times going into start times is that you'll see in the hundred, uh, I want if I remember correctly off the top of my head, I'd have to get the the paper up, but the hundred meter start time average was like, or from Usain Bolt was like 0.15 or 0.17, something like that. The hundred, the two hundred meter reaction time for the world record was like 0.19. For the sixty world record, it's like 0.14, and that just shows that that anticipation as well. Um, Dana White said football is the least skillful sport in the world. Did he actually say that? That would be my question. Did he actually say that? If he did, I would challenge a lot of what he's saying. Uh, pec deck flies versus bench press. I recently joined the gym. I have found that the pec deck has shown huge improvement in my chest. Yo, PK4, I used to love going pec deck, pec deck, pec deck. Like, let's do pec decks for, like, sets of, like, 20. And then go do dumbbell bench afterwards just to get a huge chest pump. So, um, I think they're both really good. I think it's, like, you know, oh, better for MMA, though. So, striking ability, bench press, especially at high speeds of the bench press. I would say the bench press. This actually gets us into some some bigger discussions, and I've just been screwing around with this book lately. Uh, little throwback. This book's crazy, dude. It's like everything about mechanics that you could ever imagine from the fifties. It's really neat. Um, but some people, it's yeah. I was gonna bring up dynamic correspondence again because it's it talks about how people believe like sports specificity like you should do everything to mimic this this sport exactly right and so you see things um you see somebody on on instagram doing something like cool looking you know re really neat so then you think you should do it if you're in that same sport uh because it's sport specific but then in reality it's like your body knows how to adjust power output and things like that or 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 impulse expression based off of off of your posture and your head position uh i was going to use that to describe why i think bench press is better than pec deck uh that's for pk4 i'm training kickboxing twice a week and i want to start lifting weights how can i set my training program so they complement each other this is for taha um taha 
what I would do is first I'd go to peakstrength.app, the Google Play Store, the Apple iOS Store, and I'd download Peak Strength and I'd get inside one of the combat sport programs. Select that you want to do that three days a week. Select that you're weaker. And that's going to be like the best way that you can improve uh, your combat training. Now, on the back end of this, um, what I would also recommend doing is just saying like, if you have two days where you're doing very intense sparring or very intense technical work, you don't want to be sore going into that. I make this argument with with uh, with marathon runners is like, I really, really believe there's a lot of evidence. There's a recent paper that we're, we're actually going to be putting out on uh, peak strength where they talk about concurrent training in distance runners and distance runners that are lifting weights and running have an ungodly improvement in everything. VO2 max, counter movement jumps, power output, uh, an increase in stride length, all of these things that just equate to better running times. Um, yeah. So, so to, to, to better running. Oh, Keith is saying, clarifying something for me. So, when we look at it that way, we've got to make sure that if you're training for the marathon, right, you don't want to be really sore the day before a big run. Like if you've got a 15 mile run, you don't want to be sore. You want to be all dialed in on that 15 mile run. But the day or two after the 15 mile run, you might use that as recovery and to strengthen your joints, provide some more structural integrity, anything, get some blood flow in there for recovery. And it's the same thing with kickboxing. Kickboxing is super, super technical, but also We've done this study, and maybe if, if I can find this quickly here, uh, Muay Thai, Muay Thai uh, back squat. There's a study on Muay Thai fighters. Um, oh, let's see. It's a it's a paper on Muay Thai fighters and what their cluster set resistance on lower limb body. Oh man, where is it? It's like power output. It's literally a power output uh, increase in Muay Thai fighters based off of their back squat. So what they did is they took, um, I'm going to see if I can find this at online uh, here, Muay Thai squat performance. I'm going to show you guys what I'm finding here. Okay, here we go. I got it. I got it. I got it. Check this out. Okay, so this is for the kickboxing question, right? Man, we should be cutting this and putting it on social media. Um, if we're looking at this, right, this paper right here is going to show us that post-activation potentiation for Muay Thai kicking performance. So everybody wants to get all up in arms and say, oh, we should have sports specificity. Now, this paper is about freaking Muay Thai fighters, okay, experienced Muay Thai fighters just adding a little bit of weight to their back squat, just doing a back squat, easy right? We, th we think it's easy. And I want to say it's in a matter, I'm going to go into this. I want to say it's in a matter of six weeks, their power output from their kick drastically improves. So it's like, if I'm a fighter, if I'm a kickboxer or a Muay Thai or in MMA, if I'm out of comp, if I'm, you know, if I'm in camp, it's different. If I'm out of the camp, I can do things to increase my overall strength and coordination effectively. And then in turn lead to Greater power output. So let's just look at this real quick. The purpose of the study was to investigate the effects of post-activation potentiation uh, on Muay Thai, Muay Thai, sorry, Muay Thai um, subjects and struck. Okay, so they were, oh, this is the post-activation one. Shoot, I didn't find the back squat one. Let me go back here. Okay, so actually there is a little bit here where this research was reports that a post-activation potentiation stimulus from a four rep max squat exercise followed by five minutes of rest period enhances kicking power in trained Muay Thai fighters right here. Okay. This research right here show, reports that a PAP stimulus from a four rep max leads to greater kicking power. Okay. So think about that one that's in an acute setting chronically over a long period of time. That's also going to happen. Your body's going to learn how to apply a massive amount of force. So that's where I would just be recommending if you are in a combat sport, lifting weights is okay if you're doing it effectively. Okay, we don't want to build big, huge freaking um, monsters, right, like that are super hypertrophic, but we want to increase that kicking power. Uh, all athletes need strength and conditioning. That's right. This was in lifting yesterday morning. This is from Steve. 
I'm a D2 punter. I trap bar deadlift 545 for three, and I jump 31 inches on the vertical jump mat. Do you think I need to become a bigger, stronger athlete or just better technique for that? I would say better technique and be more explosive. Uh, being more more explosive would, would help. It also depends on how well you, you can punt. Um, let me know how well you punt. I do Taekwondo. How many sets and reps of squats should I do? Six sets of four. Right there, you just saw it with a kicking power. Um, Ethan Evans was drafted from Wingate at the seventh round last year. Yeah, oh, that's great. Um, R2, I can lift, but should I do leg power all the time with calisthenics for upper body, and should I do plyos, and I cannot do hill sprints even though – so can I do normal sprints? Yes, you can do um, normal sprints once a week, and on the day that you do normal sprints, let's say you warm up with skips, bounds, um, let's say skips for distance, skip, skips for height – then you can do normal sprints, and then you do 150 clap push-ups with pull-ups on a tree branch. Okay, that's a great workout right there. You do a leg power day on day one. You do the sprint day on day three. Day five, you could do a combination of leg power or impulse-based training to help you become a better athlete. Let me know if that if that makes sense. Uh, I that's how I would roll with it. I feel some soreness between my butt and my lower back, maybe because of some back arch and bench press or some recovery issues. Should I go into deload week? I, I maybe. I don't think you have to, but I don't. I don't know. I think you could just bench with your feet up for a little, see what happens. I don't know. So you got a soccer player that needs to get faster. He got decent backside mechanics, but his front side mechanics sucks. How do you approach that, and is it age related? Usually, Keith, this could be especially during acceleration. Uh, if he accelerates from like a rolling start, if he struggles to accelerate, it's usually going to be how well the the hip here can can come back up with the higher knee. Uh, how well can that does the hip flex? So how active are his hip flexors? Um, and if when he pushes, can he? You know, I think the big thing too is like backside mechanics at what point of the of of his running because if you're in early acceleration we don't really want like a super high heel recovery um we want to focus a lot on that that hip retraction into hip flexion so i would i would see single leg bounds stair jumps help quite a bit because it forces you to to bring that knee up very rapidly and then single leg squats um Dane, what's the purpose when you have your hand on the bar when you're coaching athletes on the single leg squat? I, for me, that's just stability for me. Like, meaning, not that I need stability. Meaning, it's like I want to make sure because we don't do single legs usually in a cage. Even when we're in a cage, you know, I've spotted Lucas when he did five thirty-five. I just want to be ready. You know, it's like okay, if if they start to lean forward, I can I can get a little tug on there and get some load off their back. Uh, it's usually almost entirely safety based. I think some younger kids, I'll, I'll give a little bit of stability for when they're doing the single leg squat by holding it. Um, but for the older kids, it's more just being ready, bro. Body weight, leg workout sets and reps for strength. Listen to this one, body weight, leg workout. Okay. Um, if we went Pistol squats, Cossack squats, skater squats, jump step-ups, jump lunges, induced tuck jumps. Five sets through, 10 each side. Do it. Zach Sarwar wrestling and jiu-jitsu. I don't know what that means. I generally hit a couple 50-yard five-plus punts with hang times. Um, I play at minute state, so it's bubble season, but I think I'm hitting 5-2 hang time pump punts around 50 yards for an a ball that's great uh, i do sls single leg squat in a cage because i train alone and i don't know what else to do if to bail if need be that makes sense andrew 100 percent um what about clap push-ups on that sprint day are those going to blow up my bench press to huge numbers and get my upper body super strong r2 100 percent hit those clap push-ups or dips and that's going to help quite a bit i think they're both going to be very effective at uh at crushing that i did want to share with you guys I'm trying to run a little test. You see, I've got two watches on. I'm doing a an Apple Watch comparison to a Garmin just to see for my own fun which one says what and is one better than the other. I'm going to head downstairs. I think this is a fun time. You guys can focus on, you know, what do you guys think? And maybe, you know, I, I see that poll that came in. Athletes should start specializing around 17 years of age. I think 16 to 17 is a good place to start. You can... 
absolutely become a, a dog and a champion at the same time as long as you're getting in the gym and you're crushing that. Until next time, I'm going to head out. Peace.